Great. So Nugget Gasler and Quest, a framework for query-driven explainers on tabular data. Please. So, um, good morning, everyone. As you saw, the name of my talk changed a bit between camera ready and submission. So you have the old one just now. This is the new one, but it's the same thing. So my name is Nadia. I'm from the Technical University of Nashville, and I'm here to introduce you to Quest. Um, and this is work I'm doing under the supervision of my professor, Carsten Binning, at the Data Management Lab. So let's dive right in. The thing is, nowadays, headlines about misbehaving so-called AIs are pretty much everywhere. I'm going to leave the discussion whether they are actually intelligent for another day. But the fact is, we have heard about Black, Indigenous, people of color being discriminated against in court, being misdiagnosed, being uh, disregarded, women being disadvantaged in hiring, and just so much more. Actually, in fact, I'm more surprised if on any given day on Twitter, I don't read about a scandal like this, or at least some kind of curious discrepancy caused by a land system than if I do. Um, so what, how does this keep happening? Is basically the question I'm asking. And I think for this talk, we can boil it down to two rather simplified reasons. And the reason number one is we don't understand our own systems. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is that many modern AI architectures are by definition or by design, kind of uh, opaque. So we don't know exactly, we can't interpret the models, the, the model parameters they're learning. We don't know what to make of them. The most popular example are usually neural networks, but they're not the only ones. Another reason is just the sheer size and complexity of state-of-the-art architectures. We've heard about um, GPT-3 already in the keynote. And fun fact, GPT-3 has 175 billion learned parameters. So even if I were able to interpret one of them and know what it means, I wouldn't have a hope of retaining 10 of them to get an overview, let alone billions. Of course, also closed systems are kind of by design opaque, so we can't see how it works, we can't interpret it, we can't explain it. And uh, as a matter of fact, those systems that make it possible for non-experts to build more and more learned systems that make it accessible, that make them easy to use, also make them kind of harder to interpret because people just keep on stacking stuff together without thinking about how interactions might happen. And all these reasons, um, make it why those modern solutions we can't really explain or explain their decisions rather. The other reason that this is a problem and it just keeps on happening is because learned systems are everywhere. There isn't a part of our lives that they haven't penetrated in some way or another. Um, I'm just going to, I've just listed a few here that are particularly relevant to explainable AI. Some of them are kind of obviously critical for the individual per person with health decisions, legal decisions, that kind of thing. But there are also those that distribute information that impact what information reaches what person is accessible to what person and also kind of uh, recommender systems of any kind really because recommender systems are usually um, adopted when they are trusted and they usually people tend to trust decisions where they have at least an inkling of why this decision was made why they get this recommendation so what i'm basically saying is that explanations are just kind of very central to a lot of desirable qualities in learned systems. So the, the more obvious aspects are like, um, we can explore their fairness and their reliability, and we can develop trust and we can have accountability for moral reasons or for legal reasons, but we can also improve just general performance um, or biased performance. And we can discover actually new insights based on explanations for opaque systems. The thing is, the area of explainable AI is like a large one, and I'm just looking at a very, very small part of it today. Um, so I brought some extracts from the taxonomy of, of explainable AI, and I'm just going to walk through what I will be talking about, what I won't be talking about. So we have those models that are inherently transparent and explainable, and we have those that are kind of explained after the fact that have an added layer outwards. And I'm going to look at the latter one because it has the advantage of being usable, even if the person designing the system in the first place might not have the same preference for explainability that I do. We also have those that are model dependent. For example, they only work for convolutional neural networks. And we have those that just don't care how the black box works. And I'm going to look at the latter one because, again, it's just more applicable to, to more systems. Also, those especially where the people created the system might not want us to be able to explain what they're doing. Then we have local and global decisions, um, the explanations, global explanations being those that explain the entire model at once, and local being those that explain the decision or just one prediction. And then we have different types of explanations. 
one of them being surrogate models, which is what I will be talking about more or less today. Um, another example would be just example based explanations, counterfactual kind of explanations, Chapley values, that kind of thing. So let's get away from the theory, make it just a little bit more tangible. I've brought an example. This is um, well adapted from the UCI adult income uh, data set, which is a census data set. So we have here some information about marital status of individual people, about their highest education level, um, and about their capital gain. And we, what we're trying to predict or infer is their income level, whether it's above 50K a year or below. And I'm guessing that some of you have already spotted that we also have some predicted labels here already. So we have a very simple model um, that has learned a decision surface to make this distinction. And I think I can already see some people trying to figure out what that decision rule might be, what that decision surface might be. And there are a lot of kind of um, tangible explanations that would be possible that would fit this data, that would fit these predictions. It might be marital status, actually. It might also be related to education with like a decision point being somewhere near the Bachelor of Science. It might very much be related to capital gain being something like above 500 a year, something like this. The thing is, I'm telling you, it's none of them. The thing is, the reason this model decided which income is above and which is below 50k a year is the ID of the sample. In fact, it's whether the ID of the sample is even or not. So how does this happen? It sounds a little bit fabricated, but what happened is this data set in the original is unbalanced. We have a lot more samples for people being below 50k than we have for people being above 50k, um, which kind of skews a simple model into a major, uh, major class voting, majority class voting. Um, to avoid this, the person who trained this model um, tried to balance the data set and took one from each class alternatingly, just trying to get always have the same amount of both, which means during training, the model was always presented with first uh, class A and then class B, and then class A again, and class B again. And since we also have the ID in the data set, um, an artificial ID in the data set, that's just kind of the most reliable feature for learning. This is not particularly useful. In fact, it's not useful at all, and it will lead to catastrophic decisions if this were to be used for credit scoring or something similar. So what do we do now? We try to explain these decisions, especially those decisions that are marked in red that are actually the, the system got wrong. And we have several ways of doing this. These are just a few of them. Um, one example might be local feature importance, which is what you see colored on the right. It's basically a highlighting of what value was how important for the decision. And in this case, you see that the ID was very important on all decisions and the others were kind of negligible. This is not what we're going to see, obviously. Another way would be to learn a kind of rule-based, anchor-based, boundary-based system. Um, in this case, that might just be if ID model uh, two equals zero, then we predict one class, if not the other. We could also have like a distance-based approach where we say this is the example locally for this class, and the larger your distance is from that class from those values, and the less likely it is to be this class. And we could have something like decision trees, which again, in this case, works very similar to two rules. Of course, those are not good explanations. In fact, they are good explanations if that's what the model did, but this is not what we want the model to do. So if we look at the explanations and we do some retraining, we clean up our data set a bit, um, we randomize the samples, we might get a little more something like this. So all these explanations also work if the actual behavior of the system makes a lot more sense. So now we would have to decide for one of those, right? If I want to develop a local explanation approach, I would have to decide for what my explanation should look like. Should it be a decision tree? Should it be feature points, whatever? Thing is, if you know me, I don't like to decide. Um, so we thought, why, why do we have to? Why can't we have it all? And this is why we're going for a framework approach, which basically means we input some configurations, what data set are we working on? What, uh, what model are we looking at? What sample do we want to explain? What decision do we want to explain? And we do some instantiation. So we start like a lot of explainers at once with some different configurations, only those that are applicable to the data set, of course. And then we have a meta decision to make um, while we're training the explanations or actually after we have the explanations on which one to trust and which one to output to the user. And then we have our explanation. In theory, that sounds very good. Actually, I believe it is in fact very good because if we look at other systems that have ex uh, existed previously, so Lime is like, the baseline and field has been for like five years, um, but also some of the others. You have an example of anchors and line here. Um, they have a couple of problems. So mostly the explanations are always on a fixed form. We see line here, 
which is like the orange diagonal line. It's, it's the linear separation model that mine learns. And it's based on distance from the instant that we want to explain, which is kind of marked by that circle. So they're weighting the samples based on how far away they are from the original instance. But we also get that kind of linear separation that's only valid near the instance. And then we have anchors, which is a follow up paper by a similar authors. And they always learn this kind of boundary based rectangle thing. Um, so it always has this form and it's always just on one side of the decision surface. But we'd rather be more flexible. Um, so what we suggest in Quest is that we can have several forms. We always have some form of boundary, an area where the explanation is valid, that could be statistical or that could be absolute. And we also have some form of decision boundary, uh, decision surface, which means within these boundaries, this is where the decision takes place. On the one side, we have class A, on the other side, we have class B. The thing is, these boundaries, they could be skewed. They don't have to be like straight because we can uh, have attributes depend on each other. Um, they could also be round, they could be distance based and not necessary to the instance itself, but to another point. Um, or the decision surface might as well just not be just as linear, just as straight as we had before, which means that we get a larger area, which means that we always get an area that covers both classes. But we still have some common um, features between these different kinds of explanations. Which brings me to the point that the system is only usable if the resulting explanations have something in common, because we can't have like a random decision what the users presented in the end. We need some way of comparing these explanations, of comparing how valuable they are, and we need a common output format. And what we suggest is doing this query based. So basically, every explanation has their boundaries, has the decision surface, but is represented by the query Q, which covers all the samples of class A within the boundaries, and the query Q cross. Um, which covers all the samples on the other side of the decision, the decision service within the boundaries. So we have that here in red and in orange. Um, these kind of queries, they can use variables, so values for the different attributes. They can use constant and they can use user defined functions. The most simple would be something like not and or that kind of stuff, but we could also have something domain dependent if the user wanted it. Um, and then we have the advantage, of course, that queries can be executed in databases. We can all the usual handling with them, we can compare them, and we can normalize them to something like a standard normal form, just to have them easily comparable on basis on a few just operators. And then when we output them, we can compact this down to more complex symbols that just compress the explanation itself to a shorter form that the user can intuitively understand. And that is basically already it. Those are the main thoughts that we have. Um, and any questions or input you might have, I welcome very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Questions? Okay, Fabio. Hey, thank you for this talk. Very interesting work. So um, I love these ideas of uh, broadening the idea of uh, broadening the explanations to not just these boxes as anchors, but actually using other functions. That's very nice. I was wondering, are you aiming for global explanations or local explanations? Do you want to explain a certain point or do you want to explain in general why people have a higher salary or not? Okay, so um, right now we're working on local explanations, which is why we always have this point X, which is the instant we're currently trying to explain. Um, but a, a thought for future research might be that kind of in a, in a putting the puzzle together way, we could also adapt this to form a broader picture of the entire model. But currently we're talking about decision explanations, so local explanations. Okay, are there other questions online? No? Well, what they can I what I can say that you should keep up with this because it seems a very promising area. I'm reading a lot about line lately. Well, not lately, as you said, <laughs> but I'm reading but them you... lately. But yeah, and and there are many objections about how it works, even though it's very very interesting and useful because you don't need the model that you want to explain. Actually, you don't need to look into the model, and that's really interesting. And so okay. Keep up with work. And another question. Wait, last minute question. Um, hi, thank you. Um, you. You showed us explainability is really useful for a lot of stuff like fostering trust mm -hmm. or helping fairness. Um, do you have any thoughts on what sort of uh, goals this type of explanations may be more suitable to, to cater for? I mean, that. Does depend on the kind of concrete classes that we implement in the end or that we're using in the end because they all have that drawbacks. Um, but what we had mainly in mind when we're constructing this is kind of the whole 
fairness and robustness aspect. So finding out whether the wrong kind of attribute is being used for a decision, an untrustable attribute, an attribute that should not have been there in the first place, whether we have correlations that should not have been there. Think sexism, racism, again, that kind of thing. Right. Thanks. Omar has a question. Questions bring questions. A bit more on the explanations. What do you think some of these explanations could be useful to users and explanations that were like, duh, like no, not that important. Um, that seems to be an area, not just for your work, but also in recommender systems, like people want to explain and there's things that are obvious to explain is rain. Okay, there's, you're not adding anything versus an explanation that can have quite a bit. Your thoughts on that? Okay, so um, one question on that is why we need the explanation in the first place. So in recommended systems, this would be trust by the user, right? And in that case, what we have to be very careful about is that if we produce something the user can't understand, like I got recommended this movie because I watched the series, but I can't see the connection between the two. I don't feel like they're similar. I might trust the system even less. So we have to be very careful about the quality of the explanation. But we have other situations, for example, with GDPR, where we're just kind of obligated to have a, a, an explanation or to have accountability. And that would be a very different focus on what the explanation has to look like, right? So it depends on kind of the application process. Um, and it also depends on your data. So what Line is doing is, of course, a lot of feature importance. And that is for someone who has been doing data exploration and knows a bit about machine learning, kind of you know intuitive. If you go, OK, this feature drew me back in that direction, this feature drew me in this direction. But for someone who just doesn't understand about features, that might just be kind of confusing. And they might be, they might profit more from this instance is similar to this instance, as opposed to this one that's very far away. So it depends on your application context. So, so let me uh, give you a scenario. For, will your approach work for something like, I, I'm going to the bank to request a loan and I'm rejected. And said that you know, the bank obviously uses a machine learning model with X amount of features. Can you recommend the why? My application, for example, has been rejected. Do you think this kind of explanation should work there? Um, I think some of the, the classes that we suggest, right? We suggest a, a narrow different classes. Some of them might be very helpful because um, we have financial data here as well, obviously. And if we can go, okay, if we look at the group of people who um, have had positive capital gain last year and who have, at least have a PhD, then within that, we decide based on. That's a way we can frame like the boundary and the decision surface. And that would be helpful to me. Like, like in a very bad example, they would put something like, um, for women in the age of 20 to 30, we only grant you a loan if you earn more than 100K a year. I can go, well, why does me being a woman have anything to do with this? So that would be helpful to me. Um, having a distance-based approach in that particular example is probably not helpful because if you tell me um, you don't get a loan because I do and I'm very different from you, that's not particularly helpful. So you have to have some kind of attention when you choose which classes to use and which you want. Yeah, as I see it, I see explanation very useful for model developers and okay. for those working on the systems, but for the users, we all know the users to understand that, but it's very hard to understand the decision of a system. So you need to explain the explanation, I guess. But I, I, I think there are also social problems with the explanation of the models. Absolutely. With the bank, as you said, that, that might rise to me any concerns. But yeah, that's a very interesting area, please. But we're not in the like true or false kind of area here. There's always a lot to be discussed and a lot of opinions we had about the same thing. There's no right or wrong, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. So thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a quick one. So you <laughs> mentioned you, you were testing in model agnostic, right? So you don't have that much about the models. Anyway, which types of model have you tried with your system? Okay, so um, one thing that you need to know is that we're still, this is still work in progress, right? So the system is not done. So um, you will have to wait for the paper next year, basically, to, to tell what we actually tested on. Um, but the idea is, yes, the only thing we need from the model is the ability to put any samples that we choose into it and get a prediction. This is the basis of Lime as well, um, which is mostly the basis of, of model agnostic systems because that's how you evaluate them. Um, first tests have been on neural networks, on gradient boost trees, on random forests, on linear regression because you have to have some baseline, um, that kind of stuff. 
and bring this into IR a bit more. So I'll try to explain a re-ranker and why we have certain decisions because it's a take on explanation that I don't see much in our field, of course. There are people working on that, but that might be a good angle to teach. Yes. This. Because of course in artificial intelligence there are big groups working on this, but maybe we, we can add something else from our viewpoint. So that's a bit um, of the reason why I selected this conference is the very area within explainability that we are, especially part the part about local and model agnostic explanation, because that is currently the dominant type in, in search and in, in ranking and yeah. question yeah. answering, um, which makes a lot of sense because these things are already very complex. You have a large database. Whenever you're working on text, it's very hard to have something globally explain a model. So this is where we see a connection, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.